major weeds and, and the major insects that, that we deal with. Of course, we can't cover every, every weed because there's, there's a ton of them, but um, we'll spend a few minutes. This is the module that we use for the Grass Masters class. I've modified it a little bit, cut it down in time so it'll work for this presentation, but it's the same module that we use for the Grass Masters presentation. Well, I'm not going forward. There. Weed competition, you know, how serious is it? We know that uh, it competes for moisture. We know that weeds compete for sunlight. We know they compete for nutrients. So they are a serious problem. Um, the, the question that we ask ourselves is when, what is that threshold? Where, where do we take action? Where are they? Um, uh, okay to be in the pasture and then where do we need to do something about them, of course, uh, so that it can be cost effective. Um, weed classification uh, is based on the life cycle of the weed. We have annuals, we have biannuals, we have perennials. Um, the annuals are seed to seed in one season. They reproduce themselves by seed. So what that means is if, if you incorporate bush hogging in, into your uh, pasture management, you can control those weeds by keeping them from going to seed. Now that's not necessarily to say that those weeds, similar weeds won't be back the next year because once they get a seed bank, they can reproduce themselves from a seed bank for, for a number of years. And we'll talk about some of those specific instances a little later on. Biannuals, um, they, uh, uh, thistle is, is an example of a biannual. Uh, the seed is in the rosette, but the mother plant comes back uh, two years. So usually what happens is the first year, there's not a whole lot of uh, seed production. It, it develops roots and growth. And then the second year uh, when the mother plant plays out, that's when it produces all the seeds and, and, and reproduces itself. The perennials are the ones that are challenged to control. Uh, they live from year to year. They produce with rhizomes, tubers, and stems. And a lot of them also have seeds that they use to reproduce themselves with. Um, annuals complete their life cycle in less than a year. Uh, we have summer annuals and we have winter annuals. So the summer annuals germinate in the spring when the soil temperatures, soil temperatures what uh, generates everything. When soil temperature is 65 degrees or above, that's when those summer annuals start to grow. Some of them even before that. Winter annuals, when soil temperature drops down below 65 in the fall and winter, um, they start to grow and then they die out when the soil temperatures start to warm up. Annual weeds have a shallow tap root. Um, they establish from a seed each year again. Uh, and the, we talked about seeds and seedlings are the critical stages. So if you can control that plant from making seeds, then you can control that plant. The idea is to control that seed bed uh, so that you don't get uh, seeds germinating year after year from seed that have already fallen out of the plant from, from years past. Biannuals, uh, they live for two years. As a general rule, year one, we talked about they generate uh, from a seed and produce a cluster of leaves and a root system. The second year flowers, they produce seed and then that mother plant dies, uh, but the seeds that they produce germinate and start that life cycle over again. Perennials, we talked about those are the um, challenge, the, the big challenge because Mowing won't get rid of them. We have to use some type of herbicide management to get them under control. Plantain is a prime example of that. Johnson grass, if you think Johnson grass is a weed, that's, a, that's an example of that. Uh, you got creeping by roots, above ground stems, which are stolons, and then be below ground stems, which are the rhizomes. We'll see pictures of those, um, and it can be combinations of all of them. We'll see pictures of those as we move on through. Uh, lamb's quarter, as far as seed production, just to give you some idea of um, 
how many seed these plants produce. Lamb's quarter, 100,000 seed a year. Uh, pigweed, 250,000 seeds per year. So if only a quarter of those germinate, you still got a huge population of plants just in one year's production. The seeds are very tiny. Uh, they have limited resources. Um, they spread uh, the risk, like we said, over, over a bunch of seeds so that if uh, only a portion of them germinate, you still get that, that, weed, that weed population. And because they have limited resources, they can't last long. So if you keep the pressure up, um, the best control for weeds is competition from the grass. So good grazing and good grass will whip the weeds most of the time. You may have to use some herbicide or mowing to get them under control, but once you do, if you've got a solid stand of grass in your environment, um, it will control the weeds as much as anything else that we can do. Um, you can see um, they have to be near the soil surface. You can see from these graphs that um, the, uh, the, the closer they are to the soil surface, the better they're going to, to germinate. The, the, the further out they are, the deeper they are, they just don't have the resources to, to germinate that deep. How do we disperse them? How do we get them? One of the biggest ways we get them is in hay. If, if you buy hay that has weed seed in it, um, those seed can repopulate and, <clears throat> excuse me, and um, uh, cause problems on your farm. Machinery, bush hogs that are a big problem when you bush hog your weeds down. If you don't clean that bush hog off and you go from pasture to pasture, you're spreading those seed from pasture to pasture, just like you're planting them. Um, you got the, the, the different stages, development stages of weeds, um, the seedlings, the vegetative stage, the seed production, and the maturity. Um, when, when you're trying to control weeds, the vegetative, and usually this thing is interactive where I talk back and forth with the folks in the class or, or the, the producers, but that's hard to do on, on a Zoom, but the vegetative state is where you want to spray your herbicide. That's where the greatest uptake in water of nutrient, the greatest uptake of water and nutrients is. The more actively that plant is growing, the better control you're gonna get, the more effective your herbicide is gonna be. What I did with this slide is um, I'm showing, if you look, you see the different bars going across there. Um, this is ragweed control in common Bermuda grass. And there's two um, components to this, 2,4-D and nitrogen. Um, the first graph, is um, the um, control group where nothing was done. And you can see, obviously, it produced the, the, the least amount of, of uh, forage per acre. The 2,4-D application um, shows 1,091 pounds. The nitrogen application is 967. And then the combination of both, of course, produced by far the most. But the thing I want to point out in this graph is if you look at uh, across the board, the application of 2,4-D produces more forage than the nitrogen application. Now that's not to say we don't need nitrogen because we do, we need fertilizer on these pastures, but weed control, eliminating that competition, um, produced more forage in this study than did just the application of nitrogen. We talked about this a little bit earlier. We touched on it. What's the rule of thumb? Typically about 20% of your pasture area. Um, if you got about 20 to 25% covered a, a quarter of your pasture, it may be, you may be reaching that economic threshold where it's costing you more to have those weeds out there than, than um, you would, uh, it'd be economically beneficial to, to do something about them. 
So do you spray or fertilize first? Obviously you wanna spray first. If you fertilize when you've got weeds out there, that's like pouring fuel on a fire. They use nitrogen uh, and fertilizer just like uh, your grass does, your, your forage does. So you wanna spray first, control those existing weeds, um, and then fertilize to your soil test. You got to treat the symptoms. What's the symptom? The symptom is the weed, but you got to solve the problem. Um, the problem is, or the, the thing you got to solve is you got to have that competition. You got to have a solid grass stand to compete with those weeds, choke them out, keep those weed seed from getting into contact with the soil, or um, keep them from, from growing once they germinate, eliminate those resources, and they'll die out. We talked about this a little bit later, good grazing with whip weeds. Um, if you graze those pastures and leave four inches of, uh, approximately four inches of, of uh, leaf tissue there, they'll regenerate themselves and, and create that competition and you don't ever get um, a weak stand of grass. So let's talk about what is a weed. Um, and again, I usually ask the group what it is, but a weed is anything that's growing where you don't want it to grow. For instance, for instance, uh, if you're in South Georgia and you got peanuts planted, um, if you got Johnson grass or, or crab grass growing in those peanuts, um, that's not a good thing. You're trying to spray it to get it out of there. If you're in our area um, and you got crab grass growing in your pasture, we welcome that. That's that's a very welcome sight during the summertime when when uh, we need as much forage as we can get. What causes weeds in pastures and hay fields? Typically, it's management. Um, uh, fertilization is is a big um, uh, issue. Uh, it's management and fertility, uh, pH, potassium and phosphorus. If you take care of those, uh, those things, especially potassium, um, strong roots, strong growth, you'll make a, a competitive grass stand and, and choke those weeds out. So do you want to eliminate all your weeds? Um, and the answer to that is uh, you never want a monoculture. You never want a straight stand of Bermuda grass. Small weeds are palatable. If you get those cattle to graze those weeds, many weeds have comparable protein and, and energy uh, nutrient values to the Bermuda grass that we can raise in our area. They gotta be small, they gotta be palatable, but they are um, nutrient efficient at, at those levels. Again, pasture weeds, uh, what causes them? Lack of management, fertility, lime and mowing, overgrazing. Overgrazing is a huge problem. And that's a challenge to do because we never know what the weather's gonna do. If we have rain and we fertilize, then a lot of times we have more grass than we know what to do with. If we go into a drought, even with the same amount of cows, um, we run out of grass. So we have to be careful not to overgraze, and that's a different talk. Uh, we won't get into that tonight. Only about 15% of Georgia pastures are sprayed on an annual basis. So there's a lot of room to improve there. Um, uh, if we spray those pastures and improve the quality of our standard grass, uh, we'll be much more efficient. Do you spray or do you mow? Um, You, uh, there, there's differences uh, of, of what you're trying to control. Again, if you've got an annual, you can mow it. Um, if you've got a perennial, the only way you're gonna get that under control is um, to some type of herbicide control because that perennial comes back from the same root year after year. It can be more cost effective to spray. It's about 20 to $25 an acre at a minimum to bush hog. It may be more than that depending on where you are, who you're working with. Um, 
and your herbicides are gonna range in price per acre depending on which one that you use. So you just have to do the math and decide which is more cost effective for you as far as your management is concerned. Some of the things about mowing is there's no selectivity. Uh, whereas if you use a herbicide, you can put that herbicide out that's selective against the plant that you're trying to control, not harm the grasses. Um, when you mow it, you're gonna cut your, your um, forage down just like you're cutting that weed down. It's more effective on annuals than perennials. Um, uh, it's easier to control broadleaf weeds than grasses. And that's because broadleaf weeds have a wider surface area. You can get more chemical on that surface area. They're easier to control. Perennials regrow. So you can mow those perennials down. Again, we've talked about this, but they're gonna come back. The only way to get them under control is, is with the herbicide. Mowing will prevent weed, uh, weed seed pr production and consistency in mowing is, effect, is, is the key to effective weed control. Most times people mow a pasture one time. Um, if you're trying to control your weed seed production, most of the time one pass over that pasture is not enough. Um, if you wait late enough to do it into the late summer, then those weed seed will be mature um, so you got to cut them down early on, but you still got to get them in late summer, early fall before they mature and, and produce another seed. Mowing two times a year, three times, I would say two would be sufficient um, for two to three years, provides about 80 to 90% of iron wheat and goldenrod. And that'd be the case with most, any annual that you use, um, if, if you, uh, keep those weed seed from producing for three years um, and you promote the growth of your forage, cover that ground, cover those bare areas, um, you'll greatly reduce your, your annual weed seed production, your annual weed production. Herbicide classifications. We talked about the different kinds of weeds. We've got annuals, uh, biannuals and perennials. What are the herbicides that we use to try to control those? We have selective herbicides and then we have non-selective. Uh, selective herbicides kill the targeted plants um, and lead the desired species. Examples of that are Grazon Next and Prowl. Um, those are one, the Grazon Next of course is a post-emerge, Prowl is a pre-emerge. Um, it kills the, the non-selective ones or like Roundup, glyphosate kills everything that green that it touches. And there are uh, applications for both of those depending on what you wanna do and, and how you wanna, or what you're trying to control in what area. For instance, uh, in your uh, pasture, you, of course you wouldn't wanna spray Roundup, but along your fence lines under that uh, sort of thing, um, Roundup would have an application uh, to go there. You have contact herbicides and you have systemic herbicides. Um, the contact herbicide um, does not translocate in the plant it, it, as readily as a systemic will. What that means is um, a systemic herbicide, if you spread on the leaf, it moves down to the root and kills the root. Roundup is an example of that. Contact herbicide is diquat. Um, it causes the local injury to the plant tissue, whatever it touches, it's gonna kill, but it doesn't translocate down to the root. So uh, you're probably gonna have to redo that again if that plant regrows. You have pre-emerge herbicides um, and post-emerge herbicides. Uh, pre-emerge, uh, you have to apply those before the weed seed germinate. It does not control emerged weeds. Example is Prowl. We use Prowl to control crabgrass um, in our Bermuda grass hay fields. Post-emerge applies after the weeds emerge, does not control any weeds prior to them coming up. So pre-emerge, you got to get it out there before they come up. Post-emerge, 
they got to be up and actively growing um, before you get any control. When do you spray? Um, your winter annuals typically November through March, your summer annuals April through mid-July, and your perennials is growth stage dependent. That means when it's the most actively growing, that's when you want to make that herbicide application. I would say as far as your summer annuals, mid-July is by far the furthest I would push that. Now, why is that the case? Um, when we move into late July and August, September, sometimes we are really dry. When those weeds get dry, they get stressed, they harden off, they don't take up herbicides uh, as readily as they do when they're uh, lush and actively growing. So get them early, get enough leaf tissue to be effective, but get them as early as you can so that they're the most actively growing, uh, get them under control. Let's talk about some specific weeds. Buttercup, um, and again, we're not gonna talk about all of them, just some of the more common ones that we see. I've seen a lot of that uh, this past uh, year, uh, 2019 and 2020, and they show up in pastures where the grass stands have thinned out. Um, they'll come in there and, and compete with that grass. Um, they are toxic to animals. So you gotta be careful with, with buttercup. Um, they're, like I said, they're winter annual 2,4-D, uh, Grazon and Cimarron work well on them. Um, and then there are a number of um, other products down there on the bottom that, that you can see that have excellent control. And one thing you're gonna see as we move through these weeds is you're gonna see some of the same names pop up over and over. And what that means is those are broad spectrum herbicides and they control a wide range of weeds. But then we've got some weeds that we have to be specific with the application product uh, to get them under control. Henbit, um, treatment options, Cimarron, Surmount, Pasture Guard, you gotta apply it before it blooms. Gotta be like the picture on the left. If you wait until you get those purple blooms, it's hardened off, it's mature, it's not gonna absorb that herbicide as, as, as effectively, you're not gonna get as good control. Wild mustard or turnips, um, we see those um, in the early, early spring, they're cool season annuals. They reproduce themselves from a seed. Um, so that means we can bush hog them and, and control them. The thing about that is uh, a lot of times um, it's hard. You can see those blooms on the left or down low. So it's hard to get your bush hog down low enough to get those blooms under control. You're gonna get some weed seed production because you can't cut them low enough without really uh, interfering with the production of your forage. 2,4-D weed master. Grazon P plus D work for them. Wild garlic. Um, um, wild onions. Again, it's a cool season. It's a perennial. It's going to come back every year. You got to spray that herbicide on it to get it under control. Uh, you can see the options available uh, that, that have uh, excellent control. All of these products that you see on here have excellent control for the weeds that, that uh, we see. So excellent control is about 80 to 85% control, maybe 90, but don't expect to get 100% control in one application because most of the time you're not gonna get that kill. Um, it just, nature doesn't work that way. Some of the summer weeds. This is very common, we see it a lot. Uh, if you wait until you see this part of the plant looking like this, this is how we identify it a lot, is when we see that uh, plant come up with those little yellow blooms on there, um, it's too late to spray it. You gotta get it early on when that, before it gets that big old thick stem on it, before it gets those yellow blooms on it, treat it in May. Um, you want to get it when the plants are about three inches tall. 
two four D at one pint per acre will will work on them at that time of the year. If you wait until later on, uh, that application rate will not work. Plantain um, remedy. I'm sorry, um, Grazon is labeled for plantain. It shows effect on plantain, but I've had people say they don't get control with Grazon anymore on plantain. So uh, my first recommendation now is crossbow. Um, I would use that on, on plantain. Again, it's a warm season perennial. Um, so you gotta use herbicide. It comes back from the same root system every year. Broom's edge. Um, Typically, blooms, broom sedge indicates that we have a, a, a fertility issue, uh, more specifically a pH problem, a low pH, um, and there's no herbicide listed for control. So if you see broom sedge growing, um, the first thing I would recommend is doing a soil test. I would always recommend doing a soil test um, because uh, your, your competition, your, your forages, again, I can't say this enough, have to be competitive. Um, and the only way you're gonna get them competitive is to uh, fertilize them, get the nutrients out there that they need to get them to grow. Broom sedge is a member of the prairie grass family. It can't stand any pressure. So, when it's young and, and lush, the cattle will graze it. So um, if they graze it down um, and you've got a healthy, fast growing sod, it'll kill it out. Um, and, and that's one way to control it. But again, uh, that's the symptom. The problem is probably fertility. So check your pH to be sure that um, your fertility is where it needs to be. Cider is a common weed that we see. Uh, forefront, Grazon P plus D um, uh, works on, on cider. Again, if you um, wait until you see those blooms, it's going to be too late. Blackberry briars, we see those a lot. Um, there's different kinds of blackberry briars, and then there's Smilex. Um, blackberry briars, uh, we use Remedy um, and Pasture Guard. Smilex, uh, we use Surmount and Cimarron. Uh, Smilex is extremely difficult, difficult to control, and that's because it has a waxy tissue, a waxy leaf, and it's hard to get that herbicide to penetrate into that leaf um, as, as well as you would on blackberry briars uh, or something like that. So you have to be um, uh, effective, sprayed at the right time. And also, uh, depending on the product you use, it's really important um, to use um, a uh, surfactant to go with it. Crabgrass. I'm not sure why we would want to control crabgrass in a pasture, um, but in a hay field, um, Bermuda grass hay field, uh, really by far the best control is prowl. It's a pre-emerge. That means we talked about, we already talked about it. You put it on um, prior to that stuff emerging. Uh, Plow when the soil temperature is in the low 50s, which um, or now, obviously, but the thing you want to do is wait as long as it's, it's a guessing game because once you apply that herbicide, um, it begins to uh, break down. So you want to wait as long as you can to apply it so that you get the most effect out of it as that crabgrass starts to germinate and you can kill it out. Um, so you want to make that application mid to late February um, to, to, as a pre-emerge on crabgrass. Uh, make split applications. Uh, you can apply, apply um, about two quarts 
at the first time, wait about six weeks, apply two quarts more, and that'll give you a longer term control rather than putting it all out at one time. You've got some options for post-emerge control, um, Pastora, and Impose. Um, Impose is only for Bermuda grass and it's fair to good control, which means you're gonna get about 65 to 70% um, and it's pretty expensive. So again, your best control there is Prowl. Dog fennel, very common, we see it a lot. Uh, it's easy to control. Uh, Weed Master works really well on it. Uh, you wanna treat it when it's about eight inches tall. Don't let it get three foot tall like this. Again, you're not gonna get it under control. Foxtail, we're seeing a lot of this lately. Um, it seems to be taken over in a lot of pastures. It's very aggressive. It grows very well, produces lots of seed and, and they reproduce themselves very effectively. There are two kinds of foxtail. Um, there's a, an annual and a perennial or annual perennial and a knot root. The treatment options on the annual, um, we can use prowl as a, as a pre-emerge. Um, and the, again, that's the best option. Um, that gets your, your annual uh, knot root under control. The picture on the right shows the knot root foxtail. Um, we don't really have an effective treatment for knot root foxtail. The only thing we can do is spot treat with glyphosate. So, and of course, you know, glyphosate is non-selective. So that's gonna get um, whatever you spray it on. So again, we really don't have anything that's gonna offer effective treatment for knot root foxtail. And unfortunately, cattle don't like to graze it that much. It's really bad if you put it in your hay because wherever you feed that hay, you're gonna spread those seed. So it's, it's really a tough one to deal with. Horse nettle, um, the picture on the right, you see those little balls, they look like little watermelons. Um, that's the seed, they, those things are full of seed. Um, they're perennials. Um, they reproduce from that seed, but they also have rhizomes. So um, uh, they, they, they are a challenge. They spread very well um, because they're prickly and spiny. The cattle won't graze up close to them. Um, so they do cause some problems in pastures. You can see the options there to treat them with. Johnson grass. Um, now there's uh, some discussion and, and people have different opinions on whether or not this is a weed. Um, <clears throat> if you've got Johnson grass growing in a Bermuda grass hay field and your main crop is, is the Bermuda grass, um, Johnson grass is a problem. And the reason it's a problem is because you can't uh, cure the Johnson grass and the Bermuda grass at the same time. If you wait, if you cut it all at the same time, cut that field down and you wait long enough for the Johnson grass to cure, your Bermuda grass is gonna be too cured. If you bail it when your Bermuda grass is cured, then your Johnson grass is gonna have too much moisture and, and more than likely it's gonna mold. Um, there's some options for control. Now, um, one thing I wanna point out, ask a question uh, and just think about this answer. We see Johnson grass growing in hay fields a lot. How much do you see Johnson grass growing in pastures? We don't typically see it growing in pastures and that's because cattle love it. They'll go across 50 acres of Bermuda grass to get to a patch of Johnson grass and graze it down. And again, Johnson grass is like broom sedge. It, it, it can't stand pressure, it can't stand grazing. So if, um, if you graze it, they continuously graze it, it'll kill it out. But in a hay field, again, it's a problem. You've got some treatment options. You can road wick it with, uh, uh, with Roundup. 
Um, if you just if that's your uh, management practice that you're going to do, I'd recommend going both ways. A lot of people will road wick one way uh, and, and spread that application, spread that herbicide. You get it on one side of the leaf. But I would recommend going both ways with, with Johnson grass, get it on both sides of the leaf. That way you're getting more product on that weed um, or that grass to, to help get it under control. Pastora uh, controls crabgrass and it also gets some broad leaves. Thing about Pastora is it's very, it's, it's effective on crabgrass, but it's gonna set your Bermuda grass back some. So it won't kill it, but you're gonna get set back some. So just kind of be anticipating that if you choose to use Pastora. Pigweed, tough one to control. We're seeing some, we, we have seen already some resistance uh, to, to different chemicals on pigweed and it's, it's sporadic. It's, uh, one producer will have resistance in the same area, you'll have another producer that can use a product and doesn't seem to have resistance to it. Some products that we can use are, uh, you see them listed 2,4-D and Weedmaster, but you got to get them when they're small. If you wait until that weed is, is three or four foot tall, um, don't waste your money because you're not going to have any effect on that weed. All you're going to do is spread the weed seed. Sickle pod. Um, very easy to control. You've got some uh, several options. You need to spray it when those plants are about five to six inches tall. Um, those beans that are hanging off of that plant, that's where the seed are. If you wait until um, that um, plant uh, is mature, those seed will, will drop out and they, they can lay dormant in the soil. When, when I started doing this program, I would say they can lay dormant in the soil 10 to 12 years. One time after I had done the program, I had a producer come up to me and he said, I had a stand of virgin pines that I know had been there for 30 years. We cut those pines out and the next year I had the best stand of sickle pod that you have ever seen before. So his contention was, that those seed lay dormant in that soil for 30 years. He said there's no other way they could have gotten in there other than laying dormant. And then when those trees weren't there anymore, there wasn't any competition for them and they germinated and came up. Sickle pod um, can be toxic to cattle. Um, most of the time they don't eat it, but occasionally you'll have a cow that will have a craving and she'll start eating on it. Um, and it can cause some issues. Uh, it's an annual, so if you keep it cut down, you, you can control it that way as well with, with bush hogging. Smart weed, uh, it's not one of the uh, one that we see too very much, um, but it can be tough to control if you don't get it early on. This one, you see this a lot. Um, if you wait until this plant looks like the picture on the left or the right, um, you've waited too late. If you go out in your pasture now, if you've got thistle, you see those things growing now. They're green and, and laying on the ground now. Um, you can um, impregnate your fertilizer with, with herbicide and um, uh, spread it with your fertilizer and it will control this very, very well. Um, and that's an option that, that has become available is impreg impregnate that fertilizer um, with the herbicide spread that you get a lot of your, your broadleaf weed control. The only thing that we have a challenge with, um, with impregnating fertilizer is it doesn't seem to control dog fennel. So um, that's, that's one of the things, but most of the other weeds broadleaf weeds, we, we can get good control with your fertilizer, but you want to, um, uh, if, if, if you just have a few, it may be easier to get on your four wheeler or your four by four, or whatever you have, and um, ride through the pastures and spray them. 
Um, you want to do that early on before they get those rosettes on them. That's where the seed are. Those things open up, those little white fluffy things, that's the seed they float through the air. If your neighbor has thistle and he doesn't control them, then you're gonna have thistle. So they're a never ending battle that we have to contend with. This is a warm season perennial. Um, it's curly docked. Um, Again, seed can lay dormant for many, many, many years once they uh, fall out. The plant on the right, those seed will mature. Um, there's nothing you can do about that plant uh, short of digging it up. Um, the plant on the left is uh, lush, it's actively growing. You can get it under control with, with herbicides. Again, um, you want to treat this weed when it's young and, and actively growing. As far as the weeds are concerned, um, uh, we kind of covered those weeds. Um, in summary, when we talk about weeds, uh, not all weeds we want to get rid of. They have positive attributes. Uh, Johnson grass in a pasture, crab grass in a pasture. Um, they can improve forage quality because they have nutritive values that, that are very high. If you decide you want to spray, identify those weeds before you spray because once you pull the trigger, you can't get that herbicide back. Um, you want to treat them at the appropriate time before they're too mature. And again, um, if you're uncertain, ask before you make that herbicide application. Let's talk about a few insects and then, then we'll do some questions. Um, army worms, uh, they're uh, are a huge problem some years. They're much worse than others, um, both in pastures and hay fields. And it seems like uh, the years that we have the biggest challenge with, with having enough forage of the years that the army worms are there to compete with us and, and eat up what little bit of forage we can grow. That's kind of what the damage looks like when you see those uh, plants where army worms are. They eat the blades of the grass. Uh, about three larvae per square foot is the threshold. So that's kind of where you want to think about spraying. Um, Lanate seven demlin intrepid is, is a long-term product um, that, that you can use to, to if you're gonna use demlin, um, that's for immatures. Once they get mature, demlin won't work on them. Demlin's a little bit cheaper. If you get them early when they're immature, you can use demlin. If you're gonna use seven, make sure it's 80%. Um, if you get, um, a, a, a less percentage product, you're going to have to make uh, stronger uh, rates to, to be effective on them. So uh, make sure you're uh, buying something that's going to be effective on what you're trying to spray. Sench bugs, uh, we don't see them too terribly much. They sting the plant, uh, suck the juices out, cause them to be stunted. They are difficult to control. Um, we see them in Milo, Sorghum, and Sudan. Uh, you can treat them with Mustang Max and Warrior. This is one that, that we see a good bit of, um, and a lot of people uh, misidentify it. It's the Bermuda stem maggot. They've done a lot of work on this insect. Um, you can see uh, the pictures there of the male and the female. You can see the larvae at the bottom. Um, the larvae is what, the, the, of course, the female lays the eggs, but the larvae is what does the damage. You can see the plant there in the bottom right-hand picture. See the top part of that plant is brown. That's where that larvae is. He bores in there, kills that plant from that node up. So one good way to um, identify that 
is if you'll catch that plant, hold it um, down at the bottom where you see the guy holding it at the bottom, catch the brown leaf part and pull up. If it turns loose like the picture on the left, then it's a very, very high possibility that it's for me to stem maggot. You can't see them with the naked eye. They are very tiny. It's hard to, to diagnose them, but um, you can see the damage in the picture on the top left. Um, they can cut into the production of your hay field. They are relatively easy and inexpensive to control. Um, uh, foliar applications work. You have to treat um, after, you're, after you cut it. Um, if the levels are high enough and it caused enough damage. Two treatments are required. One a few days after you make your, the, the, after you bale it. Um, and then as the grass begins to re-sprout about seven, uh, it depends on the weather too. Um, of course, you know, we can say any days, but uh, seven, five to seven to 10 days when that grass starts to re-sprout, you wanna make another application. Any pyrethroid, um, the lowest label rate, again, they are easy to control, not uh, expensive uh, uh, insecticide applications. Um, and you just wanna be sure that the insecticide that you use is, is labeled for hay fields. Mustang Max, Bathroid, and Karate will work for uh, Bermuda Stem Maggot. I know nobody has fire ants. Um, that's, that's a problem uh, that, uh, obviously that's a problem that we see all over. Um, and they, they are a huge challenge. Um, they, they, they are expensive, they cut into production, um, they cause damage to mowers and, and, and hay equipment. Um, so they, they are very uh, economically devastating uh, to forage producers. You can see some of the damage um, that can be incurred um, in, in those pictures. As again, uh, a number of ways they adversely affect the economics of our livestock and forage production operations. Um, you can just look, I won't read that to you. You can, you can see it um, as far as the things that, that they do to, to create problems. There are a number of different ways to control them depending on how bad your infestation is. Um, if, um, if you've got uh, a few mounds or a small area that you're trying to control, um, you can do a drench or an individual mound treatment. Um, if you've got a bigger area or more uh, a bigger infestation, you can use the hand spreader or uh, the broadcasting off, that's mounted off the back of an ATV. The thing you need to do is if you're going to try to broadcast off a piece of equipment, you got to have a spreader that's small enough to shut the, the um, opening down enough so you can get the right application rate out there because it's expensive and you're not spreading very much over the area that you travel. Um, you can blame Alabama for fire ants, uh, they were stowed away in a ship that came in in Mobile. Um, this slide is, is um, a couple of years old. It says they infest uh, 3 million acres. I would venture to say that it's more than that now. Um, they're working their way westward into the more drier conditions um, from the Southeast. They're working their way westward. We can see how they spread. They're very adaptable, um, flooding vehicles, agricultural commodities, and horticultural commodities, and they even swarm. 
some of the home remedies. Um, and we, you know, you might get a chuckle out of these hot boiling water. Um, it will not kill the mound. The only way to successfully get rid of a fire ant mound is to put a, a product on there that's going to kill the queen. Now, hot boiling water will make that mound move to a new location. It'll aggravate them and make them move, but it's not going to kill the queen. You're not going to kill the mound. Gas, uh, obviously, we can see the problems with that. Um, you don't want to put some gas on the mound and light it on fire. Um, there could obviously be some issues with that. Um, soap solutions, not effective. And grits, um, I really like that one. You know, it's logical that you put that grit out there and the ant eats the grit. And then when the moisture from the ant's inside intestines get on the grit, it swells up and makes the ant explode. Um, but um, it just doesn't work that way. They don't, they won't eat those grits. Um, so those are not effective options. Again, the only way to kill that mound is to put a product out there uh, that the worker ants are gonna take down and feed to the queen. She's gonna die. Then the mound's gonna become disoriented and it dies. It can take two weeks um, or more for that to happen, but it will work. Some products uh, that are labeled for pastures and hay fields, um, Amdro, Extinguished, Justice and Award. You can see over in the left-hand column, the far left, you can see the post-harvest intervals um, on, on, uh, on hay fields. Amdro is seven days, Extinguish is three, Justice is 15, and there is no post-harvest interval on war. Um, and you can see the rate per acre that you use. Again, those products are not cheap. So you wanna be efficient and effective when you make your applications um, so that you're, you're not uh, wasting money. We have um, a, a very good website to use as a resource for forages. It's www.georgiaforages.com. Um, tons of publications, fertilization guidelines, um, uh, links to uh, ways to handle different situations. Um, it, it's very good website. So I'd recommend uh, if you are looking for something related to forages, go there. Check that out. It's all research-based information, so there's not going to be somebody there trying to sell you a product. Um, it's going to be impartial, uh, unbiased, research-based. With that, I, I think I've talked about an hour. Um, we'll open it up for questions. If anybody has a question, I'll be glad to try to answer them. You can ask it out or type it in the chat box. Um, and Haley, if you want to um, look at the chat box. Um, yes, I have it open. Okay. If anybody has any questions, I'll be glad to try to answer them. If, if I can't, we'll get you an answer um, as, as we get it. I have one. Okay. Um, um, this is Jason Hammond with the Department of Resources. Yes, I right, say um, we plant mainly food. We plant mainly food plots, um, just for habitat for wildlife. Say so we're doing a dove field, and it is just slap covered up with. With what now? You broke up on me. So I was saying that it was covered up with Johnson grass. Okay. Um, whenever we go to control. That mostly we're spraying the um, Roundup, the glyphosate in there. Okay. Um, as far as one, one, one way that I haven't tried yet, but it's been suggested to me is spray and then give it seven to 10 days and disc it up. 
and then come back after there's some more um it's uh, starting to emerge again and then mm -hmm. come through and spin and then give it seven to ten days and then plant i think that's about as effective as you're going to be um uh it as long as you don't have clover or anything in that plot that you're trying to maintain, um, Roundup, or one of the, the generic versions of Roundup, like Eraser or something like that, um, is going to be your best option. Uh, that, that would be my recommendation. All right. We're going to be coming back with, in one particular plot, uh, we're going to be coming back with sunflowers and millet. Okay. And then, uh, but there's other plots that whenever we've got to them in time, the wicking method, as long as we mix it at least 33%, the wicking method's been pretty effective on getting that taken care of. Right. And when you come back with sunflower, anything you come back with after you use glyphosate, um, once that stuff dries, um, you don't have any residuals. So it won't be a problem following up with, with any of your other crops. All right. Well, well on your two, uh, excuse me. Go ahead, Mike. On your millet, on your millet, as long as it's not in the milk stage, you can use two four D on it. It's not going to affect the milk at all. Okay. We did have a question about Resolon. Um, they said, "What about the new chemical Resolon?" Um, I will have to look that one up. I've never heard of that chemical before, uh, but I can surely find out. Um, I, I would say, um, do you know who produces it? Bayer. Bayer. Okay. Um, I, I, I'm not familiar with that one, but I can surely look it up for you. I, I grow a lot of I'm in the wildlife business also, and I've got 25 acres of alfalfa in Monroe County. And the main thing I have to deal with is sickle pod and uh, coffee weed. I mean, uh, sickle pod and pig weed. And I go in there early and hit it with 2,4 dB and cleft them. And 2,4 dB will knock a pig weed to a loop. Yes, sir. You, you're you right about that. Slow, I mean, I, I'm a firm believer in DB. I mean, it works on pig. We weed. do. We have seen some instances though where that pig weed is is resistant. But as long as you're not having any problems with it, that's that's excellent. As long as you get it early enough. You know, that is correct. Yes, plot, sir. I, I had a plot that was over the. Uh, I had a bars of a four wheeler and I hit it with two quarts per acre. It did business now. <laughs> I didn't have nothing to lose. So right. And then we have another a question on Taurus for fire ant control. Is it legal? Um, does a great job. <laughs> uh, the only ones that I'm aware of are the ones that I listed in there. Now Taurus. Now is, is that um, the only ones I'm aware of are the, the ones I had. It, it may be out there and I just, I'm not aware of it. I've used TARS. It, is it labeled for pastures and hay fields? So I'd have to look have back it. on that. There are, a lot of th there are a lot of things that work. Um, but the only ones that I talked about are the ones that are labeled for pastures and hay fields. And if it's not labeled, I can't recommend it to you. So in our um, pesticide handbook, which I have in front of me, <laughs> um, Taurus is not labeled in our handbook. Um, our options are Amdro, Extinguish, and Justice. So those are the ones that we are allowed to recommend to you. Extinguish works well. Mm -hmm. I was trying to look up that res. I looked up Resolon, um, 
it is used in it's designed to be used in Bermuda grass and Bahia grass. I don't know if we've got any information on it though. I was going to try and look that up for you. Um, I guess this is kind of the ideal time. So um, the pesticide handbook, we get a new one every year and y'all are able to access it online if you want like a digital copy of it. What we have, we've got, we get books. We actually get two of these ginormous books um, that come to our office. What I do here in Upson and Lamar is I print off a packet of specifically pastures and hayfields. So if y'all are ever in the area, you're more than welcome. I Every time we get a new one, I print it off so you can have it to your disposal. You just take it with you. So, um, and it gives you what is labeled, what our recommendations are, everything based off of our handbook that we get each year. Um, the new one hasn't come out yet, but once it does, I'll have copies for y'all here in the office. But like I said, it's not the big old book because that costs like what, I think either 50 or $75. It's specifically those pastures and hayfield portions. Is the new book going to look like that one? The new book that we're going to get? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it'll, it'll still look the same. It'll be this big also like this, which this is one of the books. We get two different ones. This volume has animals, alfalfa, aquatics, canola, clover, lespedeza, mosquitoes, non-crop lamb, ornamentals, grasses, small grains, grazing trees, turf, and vertebrates, all in this book. And that's just one volume. We get two every year. I, I bought I bought one of those one year because I like to have a hard copy of something and that thing lasted me about I don't I don't remember how much I paid for it but it lasted me about 10 days and I had that thing tore all to pieces. Actually that one's better than the one we had two years ago with the time you opened the one we had two years ago it, it fell all apart so that one that one is an improvement over the one we had two years ago. <laughs> well, the one West was still there when I bought one, and I I didn't last no time, and I didn't tore that thing all to pieces. So, what areas do you get, or what areas do you want, JB? I can, if it's like the grazing stuff, like the ones that you always text me and stuff about, I have that that you can come get it, and so then you don't have to pay for the whole book. You just get that little okay. section. Okay, I was kind of kidding, but I I I just wanted the whole thing just to you know and i could just look up stuff whenever it came to mind and um that that thing wasn't worth a flip but i yeah i, I will come get one of those packets um that you've got and then and there was another question that says can um you get a hard copy you can order it um jason if you go on to the website it and i can send you the link to it um don't order one yet because we don't have a new one out but you can order a copy to get it like i said it's like 50 to 75 dollars you can get a digital copy if you download that then you can print all of them <laughs> and that's free it just costs whatever your ink is but but yes i will send that i'll email it to katie hey i have a question we um we have something in our pastures and i don't know I, i'm on haley's going to be coming down looking at some pastures in the next couple of weeks but I call it, we call it a mock orange. And some people call it a Georgia lemon. Mm -hmm. And it's got a, about a two inch thorn on it. Um, and I don't really know how to describe it, but I don't know what kills it. Are you familiar with a mock orange or a Georgia lemon? I am mock orange. Um, is it in your pasture or around the, the edges of, of your field? Man, it is everywhere okay. it's like you sowed the daggum stuff right those oranges have the seeds um nine million seeds in that orange yep um and i think let let me double check and i'll get with haley um i think uh if you get them when they're small i think uh, remedy will, will okay. work on it but let me double check with that and see. I know they are really hard to control. Okay. And they they grow and, and they're a big challenge because of those thorns. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Okay. I appreciate it. So there was a question about justice, the re-entry. So for justice, it says I'm looking in the book. So y'all can get it from the horse's mouth, right? It says, do not harvest hay for three days. Do not graze until spray has dried. Do not apply more than six ounces per season. 
Did that answer your question? Yes, that's fine. Okay. I was just curious. I didn't just for mound treatment. Of course, that's going to take a lot of work if you go to mounds. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, fire ants are terrible. They've only been bad around here in the Piedmont the last 20 years. Yeah, they've been pretty bad around these counties. Yeah. So, JB, so you mentioned the mock orange. I just had asked Patrick McCullough, which he's the one that does the weed management portion of this book. And I asked him a recommendation on it. And so what he told me, and I will read you what he told me in the email. It says, spot treating um, glyphosate in a 2% solution would be best for mock orange. Um, there's not any good selective herbicides for the weed. Um, once the plants resume active growth in the spring, you can use um, things like PD or Remedy and okay. it will help control it. Okay. Yeah, I mean, there's, you have there's to... no way that I could spot spray. I mean, it's they they're just, and they've been like that, I mean, all my life, I guess. So if you can't spot spray, then you're kind of left with, with the Grazon and the Remedy um, yeah. to spray those things with. Which depends on how mature they are. I mean, if they're like extremely mature, then you're probably going to have to bush hog and then start treating from there. Well, that's all have... we've ever done is, is, is just mowed the pasture. And then, of course, uh, you know, in, in May, I guess I could spray them right when they first start, you know, putting on leaves and real tender leaves, I guess. They're about six inches now. Be sure you got enough leaf tissue there to get enough enough absorption um, to get that product in there, but do get them when they're young. Okay, okay. JB, I'm emailing you what I just read to you so you can have it. Okay, all right. <laughs> See, this is kind of, is I mean, the only really upside to this is I can email y'all stuff right away instead of having to get yeah. back to it later. <laughs> yeah. Is that weed you're talking about? Is it a, a woody stem? It, it is. is. It is. And that, that well, joker's really? got a thorn yeah. that'll get about two inches long on it. Well, Remedy ought to take care of that if sprayed early enough. Well, it'll, kill all your woody, it'll kill all your woody undesirables and not hurt your natural grass. Yes, sir. Well, yeah, I'm that's what try. you recommend when it has an active growth in the spring to go ahead and spray either graze on PD or remedy. Mm -hmm. JB, it's going to take you two or three years of spraying to get it. Yeah, that's, I didn't know Wes was on here. He knows what I got. <laughs> yeah. It's, it is an, it originally came in here as an ornamental and has escaped out in the pastures and woodlands and everything else. That's right. All right, so is there any questions that we haven't gotten to or does anybody else have any other questions? No? Well, Steve, if you don't mind, if you'll stop sharing, I'm gonna put that portion up that we had done before. So I can share my screen, perfect. Well, I don't want to say thank you to Steve for giving us all of this great information. I mean, it wasn't just weed management. We talked about insects control as well, which is great. Um, so what I've done, and it's still continuing to record right now until I show you all this portion, um, but I've recorded this. And so we have a, a YouTube channel that I will have it available. Um, it usually takes about a day and a half to convert to my computer than for me to convert to YouTube. So y'all can go back and watch it at any time. Um, I started recording right after I had introduced Steve. Let me share my screen. Can y'all see that? Yeah. I know it says we'll begin at seven, just uh, disregard that portion. But if you haven't already, if you will either type your name, your license number, and your county into the chat box, or if you will send me an email, and then that's my email, hrobinson at uga.edu. And I am going to do a roll call with the ones I've already got. So let me pull this one back up. So I have Wes Smith, 
Betty Lewis, Jeffrey Tosper, uh, Rufus Hartley, Leslie Giesbrich. I don't know if I pronounced that right. I'm sorry if I did not. Um, Greg Ivey, Rusty Blackston, Rodney Hilly, Steve Harper, Alan Olive, uh, LaDon Day, J.D. Haygood, Tim Robert, Mike Hathaway, Keith Lassiter, Ray Rumbelow, Jason Hammond, Katie Hammond, Alan Deegan, I think is your last name. Um, J oh, J.D., I have you on here twice, sorry. Uh, Tracy Boyd, Paul Wallace, uh, Terry Hollis, Mark Gassett, and Terrence O'Neill. So if I did not say your name, if you will either put it in the chat box or if you will email me with that. And then really quickly, so I mean, all on here is just my email, which is H. Robinson. It's pretty simple. Um, I am actually gonna show y'all our website because we have some resources on here. I gotta stop sharing first. I'm not an expert at Zoom yet. Let me pull up. And I showed this last time. So if y'all are on this one last time you saw it, but on our website, if y'all can see that, this is the Upson County Extension website. It's Upson and Lamar are both the same. Um, but on here, this is the main page. If you just type in Upson County Extension or Lamar County Extension, they're identical. Um, if you go under agriculture and natural resources, you'll see a bunch of different tabs. Um, under these tabs, we've got different like local agricultural videos, which is where this will be posted at. Um, we've got Georgia Forges videos so that you can have them all in one spot instead of having to go to all these different YouTube channels. Uh, we've got the UGA beef team videos and I try to update them about every month. Um, but we've also got this one area and it's called toxic weed identification. So what I did back in April 2019, I'm going to update them here soon with the recommendations. But Dennis Hancock had listed the 22 most common toxic weeds in the state of Georgia. And so I took that and created a booklet. So for those of you that are local guys and girls, I have these books in my office and they're in the Upson office that you are more than welcome to come by and pick up. They're free. We make them and bind them here in Upson. Um, if not, you're more than welcome to visit our website and look at them and it's, so that you can go and I'll show you kind of, I know it's really tiny, y'all can't really see, but you can actually see the books. It goes through each, each page is a weed. It gives a description. It gives how, what animals would be affected by it signs of how they would kind of start to act once they've consumed it, as well as the chemical recommendations. But all of that is also listed on this website. Like for example, we've got black cherry here, we've got black locust. So all of these are the toxic weeds. Um, if you don't live in Upson or Lamar and you're not close enough to drive, I can send you a PDF version of it if you wanna print it yourself. Um, just email me, hrobinson at uga.edu and I'll send you that and you can print it just to have it at your disposal. Tried to make it so y'all could carry it around in your truck. And if you see something in the pasture and wanna know what it is, then you can easily look it up if it's toxic. And then, I mean, and like I said, we've got some other different videos and stuff on here and you can kind of scroll through our website and find different resources. Um, so if anybody has any questions on that, um, I know Steve did talk about some of the insects and pests. What I'm going to do next month is set up a Zoom just like this for pesticide credit and get one of our entomology specialists to talk about that in depth as well to get another hour of credit. So if you're interested in that, I'll be sending out some emails and I'll send it to all the agents in the area to send out. Um, I'm assuming that's how y'all found out about this one, whether it was on Facebook or whatever. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing our website and Haley, yes i did i looked up resolon and it is labeled for bermuda grass and hay grass um hay fields um it's labeled for um annual uh grasses so um if you you know people that have a specific one are trying to control um we can surely follow up if, if they need us to follow up on that but it is labeled 
And then Chuck Lee, I have you down as well. You just gave me your number. So what- Haley, we'll, how about our joke? Go ahead. Or, no, go ahead. Uh, how about our Joseph channel? No. What is your pesticide number? It is 41960. Okay, perfect. And I know not all of y'all are here. Excuse me, I'm sorry, six yep. nine. I had to get six my nine. glasses. Okay. So it's four one nine six nine. Yes, ma'am. Okay, perfect. Yeah, Tracy, I've got yours. So in the future, if y'all, any of you, I mean, I know not all of y'all are part of my counties. I mean, we've got folks from Washington County, Bibb County, Pike County, all kinds of different places. So if y'all need another program put together, um, you can reach out to me and let me know. Um, y'all all have my email now. If you're not in my counties, then I'll probably get with your county agent to set up something. But I know in times like these, when we are restricted, it is hard to get pesticide credit. So that's why we wanted to offer this for y'all. And I'm gonna go ahead and stop recording.